my name is Ari Ratner. I'm a member of the board of PS21. Uh, I used to be in government. I served in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2012. Most of that time I was at the State Department where I had two jobs. I was a congressional liaison where I covered the Near East, uh, the Middle East. Um, and then I also worked for an official who was the top official at the State Department on economics, energy, and environment around the world. Uh, and I was his speechwriter and, and one of his senior advisors. Uh, prior to that, I worked uh, in the White House uh, doing communications. And prior to that, I was on the Obama campaign itself and on the Hillary Clinton campaign uh, in 2008 as well. What do you think the biggest misapprehension about government is? I think the biggest thing I learned in government is, is what we call the powerlessness of power. Uh, the reality is uh, when you work in government, you fairly quickly discover that often the emperor has no clothes. And, and even more scary, sometimes you are the emperor and you have no clothes. Um, that's not to say you don't have power. Uh, you certainly have the ability to affect uh, policies in very important ways and have a real impact on the ground. Uh, but the reality is most of uh, the world's uh, situations, and certainly uh, complex events, uh, conflicts, um, economic crises, uh, are largely determined outside of the halls of government, uh, and government is first to respond to them. The United States is still the most powerful nation in the world. Uh, there's no question about that, but its power is also uh, decreased over the past 10 or 20 years, um, certainly since a high immediately after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so there's a very difficult and interesting position we're in now, where the United States still remains in some senses an indispensable nation, uh, or at least the most indispensable nation, uh, but certainly can't solve all the world's problems on its own uh, and can operate independently. Look at the Middle East and what's occurred over the last years. Uh, traditionally, the Middle East, uh, like many parts of the world, are um, there's a lot of popular conspiracies, particularly around the role of the United States in controlling events. Uh, and if you look at what happened, uh, both the revolution in Tunisia, more profoundly the revolution in uh, Egypt, and, and frankly, the series of revolutions that happened, uh, none of which uh, happened in control of the United States. And the United States was caught flat-footed, as were the elites of the region, uh, and had a very difficult time responding. Uh, still does have a very difficult time responding. Uh, that's a situation where the internal dynamics of a region uh, largely uh, or almost entirely precipitated a crisis, and that crisis has its own logic and its own momentum. The United States can intervene, uh, sometimes quite effectively, uh, as we did initially in, in Libya, but even there, our ability to control the aftermath was, was very limited. Uh, and in other uh, places, if you look at Egypt, which is still a close American ally, we give uh, almost $2 billion of aid a year, uh, we have very limited ability to tell the government what to do. Uh, the government of Egypt, even when it's an allied government of Egypt, does largely uh, what it views to be in Egypt's interest, uh, and we're forced to respond to that. And certainly in cases uh, where you look at governments that are less friendly to the United States, the government of Syria, our ability to impact them is, is, is very limited unless we're going to use the full force of the American military. And even there, it's unclear we'll have the impact that we want. What does the Iran nuclear deal mean for the Middle East? I think the reality is it's, it's, it's too soon to tell. Iran is um, by all right, should be one of the most powerful uh, states in the region. It's got a large population, a very dynamic population. Um, you know, it's a revolutionary state, which means it has a lot of momentum, uh, ideologically speaking. Uh, and it's acted in, since the revolution in ways that are uh, very much uh, apart from most of the region's interests. Uh, you know, the Sunni states are very much scared by Iran. Uh, Israel is obviously scared by Iran. They've been a uh, um, revisionist power. Uh, the deal offers a chance uh, for Iran to integrate into the region and into the broader global community in a more responsible way. Uh, that would be the most significant outcome if it were to happen. I don't think it's particularly likely, but, it, but there's a possibility for it. And I think quite clearly a, a good percentage of Iran's own people want that to happen. Um, there's also a chance that the, the deal uh, is just a much more transactional deal. Uh, that prevents Iran from getting a nuclear weapon ultimately, or at least forestalls that possibility for, for quite a long period of time, a dozen years or so, um, in exchange for uh, economic sanctions relief. Uh, and there's, of course, the possibility that the deal collapses, uh, either through Iran cheating, um, through a breakdown, through ultimately a military um, uh, escalation. Um, but I think it, at, at a minimum, the deal offers the first real chance for uh, a thong of the U.S.-Iran relationship uh, over the previous 30 years and the first real chance um, to have Iran uh, behave responsibly in the international community. What does the ISIS war tell us about the region? Well, I think the ISIS situation is, is very significant and obviously very sad in a number of ways. Uh, but I would start by saying this. 
uh, the region is a region uh, whose borders were largely created uh, by European powers, the British and the French, during World War I. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the elephant in the room for the last hundred years has been those borders don't make sense. And you see this perhaps nowhere uh, as clearly as in the border between uh, Iraq and Syria, where on both sides of the border, uh, Sunni uh, populations in, C in Syria, a majority population in, in Iraq, a minority population, uh, now deal uh, with Shia, or in the case of Syria, uh, an Alawite government, uh, in, a, in a situation they don't want to be in. Um, now, obviously, ISIS is taking that to the most extreme, uh, but the only way they could get the kind of local support on the ground uh, that they have is, is by playing into this long-standing problem uh, that there are repressed minorities in Iraq and Syria. Um, and you see that all around the region. Um, there's some borders that make sense. Egypt, for instance, is a state that's always uh, been a state even if the borders have shifted. Uh, but Syria is, is a country that may never be put back together again. Um, same with Iraq. Uh, and I think that's something that we're just beginning to deal with. And the reality is that even if ISIS is defeated, and it's not clear um, that the United States and its allies is, is, is succeeding in its uh, strategy to degrade and defeat ISIS, but even if ISIS is, is ultimately uh, completely uh, um, wiped out, uh, that larger underlying problem of a Middle East that makes sense is something that's going to be with us for quite a long time. Well, Ari, thank you so much for taking the time.